Welcome to CNU, the video series that will teach you everything you need to know to provide excellent nutrition care. In this video, I'm going to teach you how to prevent and treat refeeding syndrome. By the end of the video, you should be able to initiate a nutrition intervention for patients who are at risk of refeeding syndrome and progress the energy load to meet 100% of the estimated nutritional needs. If you find this information useful, go ahead and hit that subscribe button. Let's get started. If you're interested in learning about the pathophysiology of refeeding syndrome and how to assess risk, I recommend you check out my first video on the topic here. This video is going to take those concepts a step further by explaining what happens once you have identified a patient who is at risk and are planning to feed them. It will continue to pull from the general guidelines published by Aspen in 2020. The link to that paper is down below in the video description. Before you feed a patient who is at risk of refeeding syndrome, you need to establish a plan of care that will put you in the best position to 1. Prevent it from happening, and 2. Treat it quickly if it does happen. To do this, emphasis should be placed on four aspects of care. The monitoring of electrolyte levels in the blood, the management of micronutrients, the initial energy load of the nutrition intervention, and the progression of the energy load. Since low electrolyte levels are the primary cause of refeeding syndrome, the importance of monitoring them cannot be overstated. Remember, the three electrolytes associated with refeeding syndrome are potassium, phosphorus, and magnesium. The first step for monitoring electrolyte levels is to ensure measurements are obtained before the patient is fed. Potassium is part of the basic metabolic panel, or BMP, that is checked in most hospitalized patients on a daily basis. But phosphorus and magnesium are not. In a lot of medical institutions, these measurements need to be specifically requested or they won't be obtained. Once you get a baseline measurement for each electrolyte, the second step is to check them at least every 12 hours for the first three days of feeding. This is done to catch any dangerous decrease early on and treat it with intravenous electrolyte replacement. The major disadvantage to checking laboratory values with this frequency is that obtaining blood samples can be painful for the patient, especially if they have veins that are difficult to access. If the patient's electrolyte levels are stable after three days and adequate energy intake has been achieved, the frequency of monitoring can be changed to once per day. That brings us to the second aspect of care, which is the management of micronutrients. The first step for management of micronutrients is to correct any low electrolytes before the patient is fed. In other words, if the initial laboratory measurements reveal hypokalemia, hypophosphatemia, and or hypomagnesemia, the issue must be resolved before starting an oral diet, enteral nutrition, or parenteral nutrition. This should be done by a medical doctor using the established standards of care for intravenous electrolyte replacement at the medical institution where you practice. The reason behind this need for replacement is quite simple. If a patient is at risk of refeeding syndrome, it means there is concern that the potassium, phosphorus, and or magnesium level will drop with the reintroduction of food. So, what sense would it make to start when the levels are already low? Doing that would put you at a huge disadvantage for preventing severe deficiency. By increasing the electrolyte levels prior to feeding, the patient's level would have to fall much farther before severe deficiency takes place. Some clinicians will provide intravenous electrolytes prior to feeding, even if the blood levels are normal. The reason for this is that blood electrolyte levels can be deceptive, which was explained in my lesson on the pathophysiology of refeeding syndrome. With prolonged inadequate nutrient intake, 
electrolytes can be forced out of the cells and into the bloodstream. At the same time, the kidneys will decrease excretion to retain what little amount is left in the body. These two changes can lead to the electrolyte levels appearing normal, even though the cells that use them are deficient and ready to soak up whatever is available once the patient is fed. In the 2020 Guidelines for Refeeding Syndrome, Aspen acknowledges this practice but states, No recommendation can be made for whether prophylactic dosing of electrolytes should be given if prefeeding levels are normal. The second step for managing micronutrients is to provide 100 mg per day of intravenous thiamine for at least the first 5-7 to seven days of feeding. Since laboratory testing for thiamine is unreliable, there is no need to check thiamine levels before a patient is fed. This amount can be provided with little concern for toxicity, and the benefits of avoiding severe thiamine deficiency outweigh any potential risks of the patient receiving it. The third and final step for managing micronutrients is to provide a daily multivitamin for at least the first 10 days of feeding. It can then be continued on an individual basis with consideration for overall intake and nutritional status. This is done to cover a wide range of vitamins that the patient has likely had insufficient intake of leading up to or during their hospitalization. Patients who are at risk of refeeding syndrome may have other specific vitamin and mineral deficiencies that need to be addressed. However, these would not fall under general guidelines for preventing or treating refeeding syndrome. A discussion on each vitamin and mineral is beyond the scope of this lesson. Once a patient has had any low electrolyte levels corrected, is started on intravenous thiamine and a daily multivitamin, and is stable enough to receive a nutrition intervention, one can be initiated. Here, close attention must be paid to the initial energy load. There is some disagreement in the literature about how much total energy should be given on the first day, but there is agreement that the starting point should be reduced from the goal. When glucose finally becomes available and there is a shift to anabolic pathways, the body may use up the available electrolytes faster than they are replaced. So, if there is a high amount of glucose available from the very beginning, the more likely a high proportion of the electrolytes will be used. Making glucose available in a smaller amount appears to ease the body back into the fed state and allows the availability of electrolytes to catch up with the losses. The recommendation from Aspen is to start with an energy intake of 100 to 150 grams of dextrose or 10 to 20 calories per kilogram for the first 24 hours. To see how this works, let's pretend we have a patient who is at significant risk of refeeding syndrome, requires tube feeding, and has a body weight of 60 kilograms. Using a simple weight-based equation of 30 calories per kilogram per day for weight maintenance, the estimated calorie need is 1,800 calories per day. We can follow the recommendation for the first 24 hours of feeding by taking half of that at 15 calories per kilogram, or 900 calories. If we give the patient a 1.0 calorie per milliliter formula, we could start the patient on a continuous infusion of 35 milliliters per hour to provide roughly 840 calories per day. To get the patient from the initial energy load to the goal energy load, there should be a gradual progression of the energy load. Let's see how this is done by continuing the same example. Aspen recommends an increase by 33% of the goal energy load every 1-2 to two days until the goal energy load is achieved. So, if 1800 calories is the goal, the first thing we would want to do is find 33% of it. We would take 1800 calories and multiply it by 0.33 and the result is an increase of approximately 600 calories per day. Next, 
We would add 600 calories to the 840 calories, and the result is 1,440 calories on day 2. 1,440 calories divided by 24 hours gives us a new goal rate of 60 milliliters per hour. The following day, we could add another 600 calories, if needed, which would get us to the goal energy load of 1,800 calories with a final feeding rate of 75 milliliters per hour. In summary, for this patient who is at significant risk of refeeding syndrome, we could feed at 35 milliliters per hour on day 1, advance to 60 milliliters per hour on day 2, and advance to the final goal feeding rate of 75 milliliters per hour on day 3. There are some situations where following this progression is not appropriate. As a general rule, advancing the energy load should be delayed whenever phosphorus, potassium, and or magnesium are low. In this case, the amount of energy provided should remain the same until normal levels are achieved through intravenous electrolyte replacement. If electrolyte levels become difficult to correct, reducing the energy load by 50% should be considered. An increase towards the goal rate can resume once the electrolytes stabilize. The recommendations found within the four aspects of care covered in this video should be enough for you to 1. Prevent most cases of refeeding syndrome and 2. Treat any cases that do occur before there are any negative consequences. By taking precautions like correcting low levels of electrolytes, providing thiamine and a multivitamin, starting at a reduced energy load, and progressing slowly towards the goal energy load, you will eventually be feeding your patient at the goal energy load, and by the end of the first 5-7 to seven days of feeding, the risk of refeeding syndrome will subside. Here is a summary for this lesson. When it comes to the prevention and treatment of refeeding syndrome, emphasis should be placed on four aspects of care. They are monitoring of electrolyte levels, management of micronutrients, the initial energy load, and the progression of the energy load. For monitoring of electrolyte levels, you'll want to ensure measurements are obtained before the patient is fed and check them at least every 12 hours for the first three days or until they stabilize. For management of micronutrients, you'll want to correct any low electrolytes before the patient is fed provide a daily multivitamin for at least the first 10 days of feeding, and provide 100 mg per day of intravenous thiamine for at least the first 5-7 to seven days of feeding. For initial energy load, you'll want to start with an energy intake of 100-150 to 150 grams of dextrose, or 10-20 to 20 calories per kilogram, for the first 24 hours. Finally, for the progression of the energy load, you'll want to increase by 33% of the goal energy load every 1-2 to two days until that goal is achieved. Once feeding has started, advancing the energy load should be delayed whenever phosphorus, potassium, and or magnesium are low. If electrolyte levels become difficult to correct, reducing the energy load by 50% should be considered. An increase towards the goal rate can resume once the electrolytes stabilize. Thank you for watching. Check out these videos for more content just like this.